Thank you so much. Um, and um, thank you for allowing me to, um, to speak here at the uh, MCAN conference. <clears throat> I would like to start... Um, I would like to start um, and connect my talk to what uh, Dr. Mona just said um, a few moments ago, uh, and also what uh, Basma said. And that is uh, coming back to the why. Why do we, why do we educate, uh, why do we educate children in any country, um, uh, and why do we educate them in the way that we do? My answer is quite simple. And that really ties in with what Dr. Mana called the transformative education which is required in the 21st century. And the answer is really that we need to prepare the children for the challenges of the employment market of universities out there at the time when they are joining the market. And that implies that education needs to remain flexible. So that comes back to what Dr. Mana just said. Um, that over time it wasn't like that. But nowadays, that knowledge is very ephemeral. So, what we learn today, either by reading or by the kind of education, daily education that we receive as adults, might be wrong tomorrow and definitely the day after tomorrow or in a few weeks or a year's time. That was not quite the case um, in the history of education, but nowadays, um, with, um, uh, with the, uh, in the digital world, when um, we are, and our children are inundated by information on a daily basis, when they have the world's library uh, in their pockets, in the shape of their phones, that is what it is. And education needs to be adapted to that. I will, uh, I will use uh, this schools, and thank you for the introduction there uh, on that, um, as an example of what um, it is that we're trying to achieve. And that is um, an aspect which is what we are doing um, at Miss Schools, and that is uh, adapting the education that we provide on a daily basis to what is needed in society tomorrow rather than today. Because the children who are with us today will have to function in society tomorrow. And that is inextricably linked to the vision for 2030, because that is what we are. So the children that we have in our schools today here in the kingdom will have to function in the, against the backdrop of the Vision 2030 um, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. And I particularly want to, um, want to focus on the ambitious nation because that is the human capital piece of the vision which uh, is really what all our schools should be focused on at, uh, at this uh, point in time. Now, um, when we talk about the vision, and that's why I highlighted uh, a particular uh, few words there in the, uh, that are noted in the vision, and that is what you will find in this presentation as going through as a, as a red band, because those are the attributes that we as school leaders need to instill in our, in our children, in the children of the kingdom, to make sure that uh, they can do well in the, uh, in the future. Yes, we as our schools, our visions, and what we are trying to achieve with our staff and with our students, with our parents, have to be aligned with what the vision says. Um, and we do need to make sure that our children are constantly hungry for knowledge, because it's not, as Dr. Mona just said, it's not about what we or what our parents and what our relatives and our families learned in the past that is going to be important. What is important is the challenge uh, that we, that uh, what our children put towards that knowledge in order to make sure that they are ready to discover new knowledge um, tomorrow. But what is also important, and that, that is what we mustn't forget, is that our children uh, stay anchored. And that's something that sometimes is forgotten in, uh, in education systems around the world, that in this day and age, where the world is more and more globalized, that the children stay anchored in their culture, where they come from, where their families have come from, however globalized they are as, uh, as citizens, and however well they can function in a more and more globalized world, speaking English most of the time and being connected, it, they must never forget um, um, their roots and where, they are, uh, and, and where they are coming from. 
Um, one of the last points which you also find in this, uh, on this slide, and I do um, mean that when I say fiercely competitive. It is very important, although it sounds a bit negative, it is very important that our children don't forget that the world, in order to make as much progress as we have made in the, um, over time, and will be making in the years to come, it is important that we don't forget that competition is important. Because competition is a driver, is a driver of progress, and is a, uh, is a driver of continuity. And that is what the children mustn't forget. And con uh, competition can be positive, can be made positive, and can be um, included uh, in our education and be part of the education we, give, uh, uh, that we deliver on a daily basis in a very positive, uh, in a very positive manner. We heard from, um, from, from Basma earlier that now they are, they are jobs around that when I went to school many, many years ago, and dare I say it, in Russia, where it was almost equally cold as it is in this room, um, it, um, it is um, these jobs, uh, when I was educated, it was quite clear the kind of jobs that we could go into. Because when I entered the job market, those jobs were more or less the same as when my parents entered the job market. A bit more modern, yes, there were different tools and all that, but more or less they were the same. That's why classrooms looked exactly the same when I went to school as they did when my parents went to school, more or less. Um, but in the future, that won't be the case. In fact, it is already uh, no longer the case. Um, if we go back to um, uh, what Dr. Monner, what the previous speakers have already said, and you'll find more of that here, that the classrooms in the 21st century, the classrooms that we now have, that enable us to deliver the education uh, that our children need in order to function uh, in the years to come, to be innovative, to be questioning what's, what's there, or to be ready for what, uh, what is to come. Uh, the classrooms need to, look, need to look different. In the next few slides, I want to highlight a few things that, is, that go beyond what we uh, deliver in the classroom, and that is uh, going back to uh, what, we, um, uh, what I said earlier, the vision 2030. Because the kingdom in the future does not only need well-educated well -educated people, does not only need uh, children and young adults who are ambitious, who are competitive, who are thoughtful, who are well-anchored, and who can think uh, beyond the obvious and prepare for a future that is not quite clear at the moment they set out preparing. Um, it, is, uh, it is important that we prepare our students uh, for a world that is quite unpredictable. And there are just a few premises that I've put on this, uh, this slide here. And that is um, that with the advances of neuroscience, we have known for a fair number of years that IQ is not a static feast. So it's not like when you measure the IQ when your children are 15, that that IQ will still, that number will still be the same when they're 19 or when they're uh, 25. Um, that IQ changes, so it's a movable feast. We know that the brain is much more malleable than we ever thought before. And therefore, we know that uh, we can change it. We can, we can change the travel direction. Because if the brain is malleable, if the IQ can change, surely we can change the direction of travel, whether it's going up or it's going down. And actually, research has proved it can go up, but it can also go down. And uh, that's been researched uh, extensively, uh, how that happens, how the IQ goes up rather than going down. And we know that one of the defining factors of making the IQ going up is the um, number as well as the variety um, of, and the diversity of opportunities that children have in the journey of their education. To what extent uh, we have been able to keep uh, divergent thinking alive. Many of you will know, you know, the uh, late Sir Ken Robinson um, said that very clearly in his book uh, about 10 years ago, that all children, when they're being born, have innate in them uh, natural curiosity. That's why when children are little, when they start crawling around, they open every drawer, they touch everything, they stick everything in their mouth, and that is because they're naturally inquisitive. They want to find out. Now, this divergent thinking, trying to find out, um, has over time decreased. And it was found that while children went through education, it's been decreased. So children 
are quite, are very, very inquisitive when they are tiny, and it was found about 10 years ago, as they went through school, this level of inquisitiveness went down. And it went down because of what Dr. Wana said earlier. It is the rigidity of education, and that is because we were thinking in the way of Alexander von Humboldt's model of the six areas of knowledge. What we thought children had to know at any one, at any one stage is what we taught. But actually, education is, um, is much more, as you will find in a, uh, in a, in a few minutes. Should I use this? Is this better? Right, okay. So this apparently is connected to the video. So I need to carry on with this mic, which I, um, which I will do, which also, which will also allow me to walk around a bit, which is, which might be a bit easier. I will show in the next few slides that actually what uh, we truly believe is needed education is that we move away from um, uh, being so bound by the knowledge that we, uh, when we deliver. Uh, making sure that children know about maths, know about physics, uh, know about languages and uh, humanities and all these things. And of course they are important. But what is important never to forget is that what the children are learning today, they need to know about on the day when they're learning it, that it might be wrong tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Um, and that requires, as we've heard before, a different way of teaching. And I will just go through that, what that will mean, because what we don't need, what we must never forget, is that teaching is all about developing the cognitive apparatus. Yes, of course, the children need to learn what we know at the moment, what is, what is there, what is the knowledge right now. And because that is important for developing the cognitive ability, for training the brain and for making connections. And we heard it before, um, making connections being very important because the connection making, that creates the interdisciplinary of learning, the interdisciplinary nature of learning. We mustn't forget that, yes, of course, the children learn maths and they learn science and they learn languages, humanities, um, uh, and all those things. But what is really important is to interconnect them, to make sure that the learning spaces in which the children learn, our schools, our classrooms, are set up and organized in such a way that the interdisciplinary nature of learning can be enabled. As we heard Dr. Mana say before, the workplaces are not only about maths. The workplaces are not only about languages, about geography. Children have to combine the knowledge that they've learned in any of those academic subjects um, in, in the disciplinary manner, manner in, order to, uh, in order to draw conclusions on what, is, uh, on, on, what, um, uh, on what is to be in the future. The aim really is, and that goes back to my first slide about the uh, vision for 2030 uh, for the kingdom, is really uh, to create in our schools advanced performers and global leaders as well as enterprising learners. Now what does enterprising learners mean? Enterprising learners means learners who challenge themselves as well as challenge their teachers. And it goes without saying that also changes the nature of we go about it when we are teaching. Because we as teachers also have to see ourselves as learners being challenged by the children. And that is something that's really very important because with that we give the students confidence. Confidence in what they've learned. And confidence when they make a mistake and they discover that this is a mistake and that actually is a skill in itself. That the children discover this is a mistake and I need to find a different approach um, uh, on, uh, on, on, on making better. And if they see us as the teachers doing the same, they understand us as learners. And that is the first step to creating lifelong learners. In the context of what I just said, that everything we teach, all piece of, all, every single piece of knowledge the children learn today will be wrong or half wrong the day after tomorrow. That implies that lifelong learning is essential success and that is what the children need to understand uh, from very early on um, in the um, uh, in, in schools. This is an example of the, well this is actually the, uh, an image of the NIST diploma which um, as you can see um, has four quadrants. The point I'm trying to make here is um, that the skills as far as you know, enterprising learners, advanced performers, children who are ready for the 21st century, for a society that is forever unpredictable. Any generation of students who 
who are in school from now on will be taught something that is not quite right anymore tomorrow. So therefore what they learn in school is not what they are going to need to know when they start the workplace. We already know our children, when they enter the workplace, will have to define life new, will have to define, will have to function differently, which is why the entire concept of, uh, of education is now being called into question what we're doing at the moment. I've just been one of the moderators at the uh, Global Smart City Forum, which we've held here in, uh, uh, here in Riyadh. And I had a number of professors from top universities in my panel, you know, from Berkeley, from Stanford, from MIT, and so forth. And they were all saying that many companies that are nowadays leading in the world, the Apples, the Microsofts, and so forth, don't really want universities to give university degrees anymore because they know that is not the knowledge they will need. It's not the skills they will need. They insist on training their own people. They just want evidence of an agile brain, of things that the children have created, children that the children have, that the uh, the graduates are have done in the past. And that is actually very difficult for a school to create that kind of portfolio for the student for the children. So if we just look at that, the academics. And that's going back to Cambridge uh, here. That is um, that is only one quadrant of it. And that's really the point I'm making, that yes, academics are important. Yes, of course, in order to get the top universities, the children will have to get, produce good results. But it is much more important that there are other things as well. You will see in the next few slides a few things about leadership, which if we're looking at the expectations in the vision for 2030 for the kingdom, we do all our children, all our learners, will have to be leaders. Leaders of themselves, leaders of others, and leaders of their own expertise, what they're, what they're learning. They have to make sure how that fits into what society requires. They have to make sure they understand what might be needed tomorrow, which is not quite known uh, as yet. We also do internships, which means that there's, uh, and you've seen it on the first slide on the Vision 2030, to uh, instill in the students at a very early stage um, a spirit of entrepreneurship. Because society can only be successful if there is an entrepreneurial spirit, if there is um, a readiness for risk taking, uh, in order to make sure, yes, I'm taking a risk, it's calculated, but I know uh, it will move things on. This safety of knowing what we've got now and that will still be available tomorrow and that will still serve me the right in that way tomorrow and I will still uh, make money on exactly that type of, uh, type, type of thing the day after tomorrow, I think that needs to be rethought. And that's why entrepreneurship and the, and the risk-taking aspect of it is, uh, is very important. I mentioned how important the anchorage in, the, in society is particularly here. And that's why the national identity piece is, uh, is of high importance. Now, while this is a diploma uh, which uh, we are offering at risk schools, and that's, uh, that's quite revolutionary here in many ways, um, uh, it uh, is in the process of being underwritten by Cambridge because it's actually adaptable to in many other aspects. Because the important bit about it is that the academic subjects is only one bit of the uh, of the education, and that goes with what Albert Einstein said in 1938. That when he was asked, "What do you think is education?" and when he answered, "Education is what remains after you've forgotten everything you've learned in school," and that's really quite important to remember. Because, yes, we've all learned maths at some stage, but unless our careers have required us to do maths, we will forget it. We will not get the thing, forget the things that we need every day, like to work out percentages and to multiply and to add. That's what we need every day. But, you know, how many of us who are not mathematicians, who, are not, who don't do maths in our daily work, will remember how to do the logarithms, the sinus and cosine and all of that? Well, we'll forget it because we're not using it anymore. And we mustn't forget. That is true for our children as well. So a lot of what we, what we teach them every day, they will forget. But we still teach them because it's the current knowledge which they need to have in order to develop new knowledge. But the developing of new knowledge is really what is, what is most important. I've mentioned before, this leadership cycle is uh, really what in our teaching is very important. That we do believe that in keeping with the vision for 2030, our children, all our children in the kingdom, need to be leaders. 
That doesn't mean they're leading companies. It doesn't mean that they're leading organizations in large, um, large units. Not necessarily. They also need to lead themselves. They also need to lead um, in their families. They also need to lead when it comes to their expertise. Because if you don't lead as far as your expertise is concerned, you actually are closing the door to making sure that, uh, that you can make progress on it, that you can stay in the lead of your, of, of your, of your expertise. Now, for that, um, and when the um, when this Royal Highness of the Crown Prince um, founded this school in 2016, and he defined leadership as one key aspect of what this school needs to, uh, needs to provide, it needs to do, we have to, of course, think about that because we cannot just do leadership like it is done in many other schools as a bold one, as a uh, as a skill. So we thought about it very deeply and conceptualized that yes, leadership is a skill. It is indeed a skill which needs practicing, that, that is true, but it's also an academic discipline. And we know that it's an academic discipline because it has an evolution like all academic disciplines. Now, in 1960 or 1950, good leadership required completely different skills and a different set of knowledge than it does now. Because in those days, it was, you know, one leader made decisions and everybody ate it, everybody else followed. And that is not quite the case anymore, as we, uh, as we know, because we have inclusive leadership and we make sure that everybody is involved. So, but that also means that by 2050, what, is, what will be required for leadership will, will again be different from now. Like any academic discipline, it has an evolution. So it was different in the past. Uh, we, we have now, and leadership has been defined uh, very, very uh, comprehensively. In, uh, um, in many pieces of literature, but we also know that it will be different uh, in the future. And most importantly, and that is what I spend, want to spend a minute or two on, leadership is also a behaviour type. And that really comes down to, as indeed at Miss Schools, we are High Performance Learning School, we believe that all children, and I do mean all children, unless they have a learning disability, uh, all children can do well and can be high performance. And they should really be. And if they are not, there's something going wrong. If children don't get one of the top three grades in any, in any examination system, there's really something wrong. Because these education systems and these expectations have been set for the general public. Not for Einstein, but for the general public. And therefore, there should not really be a reason why children don't get one of the top three grades. But every year we find that some don't. And that is, and we've heard that before, that, that comes down to the school, to what degree we personalize our learning, to what degree we identify those children that might struggle with one aspect or another, and what we do um, to counteract it, to do something about it. We all have learning support, special educational needs, and all kind of thing. That doesn't mean they're disabled, no, they just have a particular problem. And we know that education, while we're always looking for progression, we know that in education, that progression is not linear. It comes in peaks and troughs. You know, children do better at some stage and in some, some, some subjects than in others. And that, uh, that must be the goal. And that ties in with leadership, about their leadership of their expertise. The children need to know where they stand. The children, and that is something they need to be taught. They need to understand if I have a problem with a particular aspect in maths or in languages, in Arabic, in literature, or whatever it might be that they recognize they have a problem. And when it comes to leading others, leading others does not only mean that you are in charge of others. Leading others also means, what do I learn from others? And what, how does my own learning contribute to the learning, uh, to the learning of, um, of, uh, of others? So when it comes to leadership as a behavior type, we have to think about that uh, very deeply. Because when we looked at the what is naturally termed as natural leaders. They are the most successful leaders, people who lead big companies and have big success there. And when you then look at their biographies, like Steve Jobs, for instance, how come that he was so successful? One of the reasons was he had ambition, and he, at a very early stage, was discovered that throughout his young life, he, was, he watched other people being successful. So the very, very keen, very keen motivation, uh, his driver was success. 
and how do others do that? So he was copying the traits of other people. Now these behaviors, of course, when we look at natural leaders, they happen through circumstances, whatever those circumstances might be. But we, of course, in education can't rely on the fact that these circumstances will be there for all children. Therefore, it's important to create them in school. And I think it's important that the schools, when it comes to coming back to Einstein's quote just now, education is what is left after you've forgotten everything in school, you've learned in school, it's important that we create those opportunities. And if you remember one of my first phrases, it was on the, uh, one of the slides here, is when it comes to the development of the IQ, making sure it goes uh, the, in the direction of travel is up rather than down. One of, those, one of those aspects was opportunities. And also in leadership, we need to provide opportunities, and not only to develop the skill, but also the behavior. And for that reason, we've done the, we've done the following. We've done a leadership, in this leadership pipeline, what we're doing is, we are embedding leadership in the curriculum from very early on, in fact from primary, not only from grade 7, but from primary, all the way into, uh, into grade 12. And that is, and I'll come back to that next slide, what that, what that means. But we also have sort of leadership opportunities that is making sure there are boot camps, that there's uh, Duke of Edinburgh, there's uh, all sorts of leadership opportunities. We have a head boy. Uh, the boys' school, head girl, the girls' school, all of those are leadership opportunities. But with those leadership opportunities, the children don't learn the, um, the leadership behaviors, because behaviors have to be instilled over a longer period of time, ideally throughout education. And for that, re for that reason, we have deconstructed um, a leadership course, extracted from it the leadership skills, and juxtaposed those with activities that train and instill uh, and practice those leadership skills. What I'm saying is, you can learn maths or science or geography or uh, any humanity, business studies, economics, while doing activities that are actually leadership activities. Which means, for instance, in primary, the children would not know that they are actually learning leadership behaviors because they're doing activities, practicing uh, certain academic skills in sort of a leadership package. And that trains those attributes, those behaviors that are so difficult to instill. And when they practice leadership, and then we've already seen that in, in, in very tiny children, actually, when they practice leadership, those behaviors come to the fore. And they kind of learned them by osmosis, you know, as they went through education without, without really knowing um, that they were uh, necessarily leadership, uh, leadership skills. Yes. <coughs> yeah. if, I, um, if I just uh, leave you with this um, about um, uh, you know, shaping leaders in, uh, in schools, lessons for the future, and these are all, most of these sentences are coming um, from, our, from our students. So we just uh, gathered them over, uh, over time as we've been going through this journey. And um, can I just draw your, um, draw your attention to the, last, uh, to the last sentence there? That um, leaders are always agile, divergent in approach, and uncompromisingly principled. And that's really something which I hope you're taking away from this talk that uh, the principled nature of what the children do as leaders, leading their own activities, their, leading their own expertise, leading their own learning, and making sure they contribute to the learning of others, and have others, their friends and their peers, um, influencing uh, their learning. I think that's, those are the uh, important messages I want to leave you with, uh, with here. Coming back to the vision for 2030, it is not only the knowledge that's important, it's what to do with the knowledge. How to make sure that uh, the children can expand their skills with their knowledge and are ready to uh, shape new knowledge uh, in the future. That is what is needed uh, in the kingdom at the moment and that is what was meant when the vision for 2030 was put together and when it was publicized. We are seven years down. So seven years ago, the vision 
was announced, and we have about seven years left um, to make sure it comes to fruition. We are well on the way, and I'm sure we will all make our contribution our own ways. Thank you very much. As I finish, just a, just a few picks here from Miss Schools. Um, we opened last summer. It's quite an iconic school. Um, should, you ever, should your travels take you to Riyadh, uh, please don't hesitate. Do have a look and come around. It, what is interesting is, uh, one could argue the facilities are really quite breathtaking, and they are. We've got many visitors. When I opened the school uh, in August, I said to the staff there, we mustn't forget we're also a showplace, but most importantly, we are a statement. And let me just leave you with that. It's also a political statement, meaning when the vision was announced, the world was stunned by the vision. But now in the shape of the schools, they see we put our money where our mouth is. We don't only talk about education, we mean business. And the amount of funds that went into, uh, into the school as a, as a beacon for the, for, for the kingdom clearly shows um, that Saudi uh, is investing in its very, very many uh, young people to make sure that the kingdom uh, can rise up to, uh, to be a world leader in, not, in lots of distant future. It's interesting that this kind of a school was established at a time when education spending in the West has been going down. If we use the UK as a case in point, education spending has been going down substantially since Tony Blair left office. That is more than a decade ago. Thank you very much. Thank you.